Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you all, dear friends. I know that you're coming in from all over the world. Happy 2024. Happy January 2024. We made it. We are here, and I hope that you all have been having a wonderful start to the new year. My name is Dr. Shamini Jan, and I am so pleased on behalf of our nonprofit Consciousness and Healing Initiative to be hosting this year's webinars on healing with incredible leading lights in the community who are forwarding the science of healing and the practice of healing. It's all um, free and online and we also want to thank our chi contributors who helped make these webinars possible by donating $108 a year or about $9 a month, the cost of probably a, a green juice these days. Um, and incredibly nourishing, like a green juice might be, and easier to digest sometimes than a green juice. Thank you so much to all the Qi contributors who help make this possible. As you know, as a thank you, all Qi contributors will be able to watch this webinar um, freely, you know, in perpetuity on the special Qi Contributor Center where we have other goodies for Qi contributors who help the nonprofit share this more broadly with the public. I would love to hear where you guys are coming from. Hopefully we've got chat enabled so that you can pop into chat um, and let us know where you're hailing from. It's always great to know where everyone is coming in. Often we have people coming from, here we go, Belmont, California. So we've got Portugal, Vancouver, Romania, India, we, really incredible. And so some of you are up very late <laughs> for this webinar. Thank you for joining us, North Carolina, Turkey. Boston, Buffalo, Blue Ridge Mountains, Denmark, um, Bulgaria. I just love that we can come together in resonance across the world for these webinars. And thank you so much for joining live because as you know, some of the joy of this is being able to come in live and connect with each other on really beautiful topics that we're all so passionate about regarding healing. And so with that, I am absolutely thrilled to introduce our first webinar guests for 2024. Um, they need any of any of you, any of you who have been following biofield research for the past few decades know that these two people need really no introduction. They have been forwarding biofield science for many, many years and have done, you know, individually and collectively incredible work. But for those of you who may just be diving into biofield science and aren't familiar with Richard and Anne, I'm going to tell you a little bit about them. We'll start with our dear colleague Richard Hammerschlag, Dr. Richard Hammerschlag, who began the Consciousness and Healing Initiative with me and has been serving as co-director of research for the Consciousness and Healing Initiative since we began our journey. Richard's initial 25 research 25 year research career in neurobiology was initially based at the Beckman Research Institute at the City of Hope in Duarte, California. He served there as associate chair in the Division of Neurosciences. His second research career was in acupuncture and complementary and alternative medicine, and that led him to Portland, Oregon, where he was Dean of Research at the Oregon College of Oriental Medicine. He served as co president of the Society for Acupuncture Research and was an executive editor for the Journal of Alternative and Complementary Medicine. He then such retired, we're joking about what ret retirement means in this community. Since his retirement, he's pursued an interest in biofield physiology, serving both as a co-director for research for the Consciousness and Healing Initiative, as well as an institute scholar for the Institute of Integrative Health. We'll move now to introduce you to Dr. Ann Baldwin, who is a recently retired professor of physiology at the University of Arizona and director of mind body science. Again, retirement just means that we get to do different things, not that we don't get to do things. <laughs> Ann has many, many passions in energy physiology, but I'll tell you a little bit more about her, her background. Her degrees are a bachelor's in physics from the University of Bristol in the UK a master's in radiation physics and a PhD in physiology from the University of London. In addition, she is a practitioner and um, a frontier biofield scientist, as well as a mainstream biofield scientist, we could say. She's completed biowell training level two. She's a certified heart math trainer. She's a Reiki master and a certified trauma release expert provider. She's also experienced in equine assistant learning. With these tools as a practitioner, Anne helps people reverse the damaging effects of stress on mind and body. 
She's published over 125 articles in peer-reviewed scientific journals and two books, including Reiki and Clinical Practice, A Science-Based Guide, and The Vagus Nerve in Therapeutic Practice, Working with Clients to Manage Stress and Enhance Mind-Body Function. Anne has received 30 years of funding from federal institutions and has served on review panels for the National Institutes of Health. With her Reiki training and scientific background, she bridges the gap between energy healing and quantitative scientific inquiry. In her spare time, Anne likes to ride her horse and is a horse handler for the therapeutic riding of Tucson. So hopefully this gives you a sense of the brilliant lights that are sharing their hearts and minds with us today on a very, very special project. As you know, at the Consciousness and Healing Initiative, what we like to do is bring the community together to forward impactful projects that benefit the whole. And one of those levers of change to bring healing into healthcare, self-care, and community care is making sure that we are publishing great research in the area of healing practices. Richard and Anne have led an incredible group of people to forward what we call evidence reporting guidelines for biofield therapies. And we're gonna unpack a little bit about their project today and the impact that it's going to have. We're just absolutely thrilled to have you both. Thank you so much for being here. We'll begin really with just making sure that we're all clear on terms, Richard and Anne, because this term biofield has been used now for several decades. Most of us in our community are familiar with the term, but most of us may not know actually the origin of the history and it's important for us to understand what you mean by biofield and biofield therapies, because you've just created a whole guideline for reporting on research of clinical therapies uh, for biofield therapies. So what do you mean by the term biofield therapies? I can jump in on that one. Um, we want to limit, especially for the purposes of our paper, um, what biofield therapies are. So I see them as a family of healthcare interventions, of course, that can be delivered with either light touch um, on the body, with non-physical touch, uh, what we call off the body, or a combination of both, or with what we call distant healing or distant healing intention. So um, by this definition, we're including obviously uh, external qigong, reiki, therapeutic touch, healing touch, um, and a whole variety of similar practices. And I could give up just a brief uh, background um, as to where the term came into use. Um, in, oh my gosh, 1992 was over 30 years ago somehow. I, I, it's hard for me to get my head around just that. But there was a conference hosted by what was called the Office of Alternative Medicine. And that office, OAM, was newly created. Uh, Congress mandated that the NIH should have an office to oversee and evaluate um, a lot of so-called alternative therapies. The mission of NIH being to evaluate what people are using and to make sure that they're safe and effective. So they had a conference to determine under this huge umbrella of alternative therapies, how can we group um, what we're looking at into areas that we can then begin to evaluate. So one of the committees, which was chaired by the biophysicist Beth Beverly Rubick, was asked to focus on what then were called energy therapies. And um, they all seem to include some sort of concept of a vital force, even though each one varied in their explanatory model and, and also probably the cultural context. So um, the committee wanted a term that would be acceptable, not only to all these various practices, but as well to the scientific and broader healthcare communities. So um, what they came up with was uh, biofield therapies because they hoped that this would be generic and malleable enough 
to fit different explanatory models of therapy. So what right. do you think, Ann? Could you want to um, get some input on what what we're calling biofield therapies? Oh, I think you've you've explained it very well. I think that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. And maybe we can start with you. And also, I want to mention that we will leave some time for questions toward the end. So those of you who are joining us on Zoom, um, if you go to the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little box there that says Q&A. And you can just type on it, click on it, and then you can type in your question, and we will get to them toward the end of the hour. So thank you, Richard, for kind of helping us understand where that term biofuel came from. And then your definition for this particular project that we forwarded here um, at the Consciousness and Healing Initiative on these clinical guidelines for reporting on clinical studies of biofield therapies, which are including things like Reiki, healing touch, hands-on and hands-off approaches, just clarifying in this case, not necessarily acupuncture, homeothera homeopathy, but really, you know, what we call the hands-on healing, distant healing, energy healing types of practices was the focus for this. So why, why did you set out to create these guidelines for reporting of biofield therapies? And maybe you can lead us off and help us understand what's, what's the value and purpose of doing something like this? Well, um, there are guidelines for research, the consort guidelines for more general research, but we noticed that there are particular specific things about um, biofield therapies that um, weren't addressed in these guidelines. So for example, I'm most familiar with Reiki. So sometimes you do Reiki hands-on, sometimes you do Reiki hands-off, sometimes you do Reiki from hundreds of miles away. And there's nothing in consort about um, how you are doing the protocols and um, exactly what type of protocol. I mean, there are many different branches of Reiki. So all of these things need to be reported accurately so that people can understand the significance of the results and also repeat the results. Um, so that was the main reason. Um, there are specific things about energy healing that are not taken account of in the consort guidelines. Mm -hmm. Sure, the consort guidelines were were set up by the biomedical research community uh, when many many of the um, journal editors were realizing that um, the reporting of the clinical trials, which is so important. If someone else wants to reproduce the trial, you need all of the, the details of the protocol and what you did. But if some of those items, as they, as they were finding, were uh, sometimes reported and sometimes not, um, they formed this initial set of reporting guidelines called CONSORT, which uh, stood for Consolidated Standards of Reporting Trials. But these were meant for all types of interventions, biomedical, and they, I'm sure they envisioned, didn't envision at the time that it would also be extended to uh, many non-biomedical types of interventions. But when it came to uh, describing what you needed to report for the intervention, they had to have a, a very generic uh, way of phrasing this. And they simply said um, they should be, the intervention should be described, I think they said, with sufficient detail to allow replication. Well, that's fine if you want a set of guidelines to cover all types of interventions, but many individual uh, researchers who were, for example, researching acupuncture, realized that that needed to be spelled out, that needed to be expanded so we could say um, what gauge acupuncture needles were you using, um, um, how were they, um, how was the acupuncture delivered, um, many aspects of how were the acupuncture selected. So, so one of the first um, adaptations of CONSORT was called STRICTA, which stood for um, Standards for Reporting uh, Clinical Trials of Acupuncture. It was a nice acronym called STRICTA. And that led to um, uh, guidelines for homeopathy, 
guidelines, even for yoga and for herbal therapies. And um, from Anne's experience, which she can talk about with the Center for Reiki Research, where they post on their website every uh, trial of Reiki and they evaluate it, they were finding that there was inconsistency of reporting. Um, Meredith uh, Sprengel, our third um, co-author, had created a searchable database of biofield research trials, um, finding several hundreds of, of trials of Reiki and external Qigong and uh, therapeutic touch and the others. And again, um, inconsistency. Um, Shamani reported this herself when, in 2010 when she did one of the first comprehensive um, systematic reviews of biofield therapies. And I found the same thing in following up um, in 2014 when I published a systematic review of, only, of biofield therapies that only used non-physical touch um, in their interventions. So there we were um, deciding that it was time to have a set of reporting guidelines for biofield therapies. That's great. So just, just to make sure, you know, we're all on the same page and we understand what all of this goodness that you've just shared with us, we do know that there are guidelines typically for medical research called consort, which you went over, which just kind of give basic understandings of things that you need to report how you use the statistics, you know, a little description of the intervention. And Richard, as you shared, the acupuncture community realized that they needed to create a modified version of this to better capture what is actually happening therapeutically that might be important to outcomes. And so what I hear you saying, and and, and by the way, I think those who aren't familiar, you may know that um, the, the stricter guidelines for acupuncture really up-leveled the quality of acupuncture research because now everybody knew what the standard was and what they needed to report. And as you mentioned, because we've done these systematic reviews, we started noticing, you know, 10 years ago that we, there's variance in methodological quality because sometimes these are practitioners that aren't even trained in research that are doing their best to capture the outcomes that are happening. They may partner with a research intern or someone else. And without those kinds of guidelines, it's really difficult sometimes to know what to include and what not to. And then a reviewer might read a paper and say, oh, this isn't very good quality because you didn't report this, that, and the other. So what I'm hearing is that you guys really bridged a gap, that a really huge gap in, first of all, having guidelines that can share the uniqueness of biofield therapies that's different from the medical model. That's why you thought, oh, we can't just use consort. There are specific things related to biofield therapies that are meaningful to outcomes and they're not being captured. And two, you're, no, you're now with these guidelines able to empower researchers and practitioners across the world to all use the same standard which is going to up-level the quality of research. So bravo, because this is a really big deal. Um, it's really gonna carry the global research forward for biofield therapies and it needed to happen. And I understand it was um, a labor of love. It was a lot of work. And you know, for those who kind of might be curious, well, how did you create this guideline? How did you make sure, for example, that healers voices were included you know, those of you who have been with the Consciousness and Healing Initiative know that, you know, part of our magic is to make sure that we're bringing the wisdom and the knowledge from both healing practice and healing science and fostering collaborations and research. So can you tell us a little bit about how you went about creating these guidelines? Who was involved and what kinds of questions did you land on? Maybe I'll start here. So um, I'd like to talk about my experience with the Center for Reiki Research because I'm the research coordinator and um, one of our jobs is to look at every single original Reiki study that is published in a peer-reviewed journal and then evaluate it and summarize it in words that um, a non-scientist can understand. And during the evaluation process, we discovered that there's a lot of um, inconsistency and inadequate detail about the protocols. Um, not just the protocols, but also the practitioners. Very often, they just say, um, you know, a Reiki master applied the Reiki um, 
for five minutes or something like that. And we need to know how much experience did that Reiki practitioner have? How many years? How often do they see clients? Um, what branch of Reiki, et cetera? And all of that was missing. Where did they place their hands? How long did they place their hands in each position? We need to know all of that if we're going to be able to evaluate the results and to repeat the experiments. Um, also, what happened? I mean, even the the protocol is lacking, the precise protocol. Um, for example, how far away was the practitioner from the um, receiver? And um, how often did they have the Reiki sessions? Um, who else was in the room? All of those are important details that are missing in a lot of the, um, the, the papers. And interestingly, we get papers sometimes that have exquisite detail about the data collection and the statistics and very little about what is actually happening with the Reiki or with the other biofield therapies. So that really helped us well, guided us in deciding exactly what we needed to include in these guidelines. Sure. Thanks, Sam. So what we did was um, a three-phase process. And, and I have to say that I was, uh, I was sort of the sous chef in creating the stricter guidelines during my acupuncture career. I, um, I worked very closely uh, in developing those guidelines. And there's a standard, I worked with, with Hugh McPherson, who unfortunately is, is not with us anymore, but he was the, the visionary who saw how important it would be uh, to create guidelines for acupuncture. So I had some experience and I knew that there was a three phase process. So Anne and Meredith and I, from our experience, we first developed a, a core set of, um, of items. And so that was phase one. Phase two is what's called the Delphi process where you contact um, people from around the world who've had experience um, either in conducting research in the area you're interested in, or even better of conducting systematic reviews. So they look at um, all of the studies and, and evaluate them as a whole. So a Delphi process means you invite a panel of subject matter experts. So we, we invited, I think it was around 40, uh, we sent out letters to, for about, to about 40 people. And I think almost 30 um, accepted our invitation. So we formatted our initial items and asked each of our um, panel members for this Delphi process um, to rate each of the questions in terms of their importance from, from uh, on a five point scale. And we gave them um, white space to change the wording. Even if they liked the question, they might've thought there was a clearer way to word it. And we got the responses back from um, these uh, 30 uh, researchers. We collated all the responses um, and only those items that scored at least four out of five were accepted for a second round. We sent out a second round. We got, again, um, their right, their rating, their fine tuning. We had also asked them, was were there any uh, items that we hadn't included that they felt we should include? So we had a final list. We came up with a final list of 15 items in five categories. So these categories were um, the biofield therapy for the rationale. Um, why did you feel that this particular biofield therapy would be effective? And um, what was the type of therapy? What kind of Reiki, what kind of external Qigong um, did you use if there was a particular um, lineage for that uh, therapy. Um, so biofield therapy rationale, the treatment protocol, what was your control or comparative group? What was that protocol? Um, items about the practitioners, um, what was their level of education and experience? 
what were our other criteria for choosing who the practitioner should be? And then a fifth uh, kind of catch-all category for other components of the treatment. For example, we included um, was communication between the practitioner and the patient or the subject, was com communication allowed or not? Um, were other people in the room besides the practitioner and the patient during the treatment? Um, was adherence to the protocol um, checked? Was it assessed during the, the, during the trial period? So we had two, two rounds of the Delphi process. We had this final list of 15 items. And then what's usually done um, is when it's possible to have an in-person meeting of, again, subject matter experts and people who've done systematic reviews, and including at this point, journal editors of the journal, editors in chief of the journals where most of this type of clinical trials were published. So because it was COVID time, we had two, two meetings on Zoom which we included uh, representatives from various complementary and integrative medicine organizations, including organizations of biofield therapies. And we included four editors in chief of key journals that had published many um, clinical trials of biofield therapies, and they helped us finalize the list. It's incredible. it's incredible what what you've done and you know just to, to amplify the impact of this because you were able to bring in subject matter experts who have conducted research carefully conducted research whether it's systematic reviews or their own clinical trials in these areas but i understand that you also brought in healing practitioners to have input on these items as well yes and just the feat of being able to bring 30 subject matter experts both in practice and in research together on an online platform and sort of cohere the collective knowledge to be able to create an initial list is is quite remarkable it's not an easy thing to do and even harder when you're you don't get the you know the carrot of being able to come into a beautiful place all together and you know have have kind of ways to get everyone to volunteer to do all this. Um, so kudos and congratulations to you and the entire team for what you've done, um, bringing this together. So I'm really curious about the dynamic tension that you may or may not have experienced or explored between research and practice here, because I think the, uh, those of us who are listening right now, we already have a sense, wow, research is really precise. You want all these nitpicky details. You want to see that there's adherence to a protocol. And some healers don't even really have a protocol, right? They, you know, they get in there and they do what needs to be done. And they may use this practice and that practice. So it seems that, you know, in the research that I have certainly conducted with biofield therapies and my colleagues as well, that there always seems to be a dynamic tension between what the practitioner is doing and what the researcher thinks is important. And I'm curious how that was kind of explored and addressed as you came to bringing these guidelines together. Maybe I'll go in there. So I think it's really interesting because I can see both sides of that being a practitioner and also a scientist. And of course, if you're doing a clinical trial, you want to um, minimize the number of what's called confounding variables. So you want to see if the results were caused by the biofield therapy not, rather than by music that might have been playing or aromas that might have been present. So you have to limit everything else and keep everything the same. And that also means the practitioners must all do exactly the same kind of therapy. They must place their hands at exactly the same places for exactly the same amount of time. And perhaps when they're doing their, their like seeing their regular clients, they vary it. Maybe they vary it according to the client. Maybe some clients like something and some clients like something else. So you do have this, this um, opposition between the two. Um, but that makes it even more important to report accurately what you're doing. Um, so recently, I've been involved in, in a couple of these studies. Recently, um, someone called Natalie Dyer has headed two, um, has headed several projects where 
people have gone to their regular Reiki practitioners and filled in questionnaires before and after their treatment um, so that we can analyze what happens during normal Reiki, um, Reiki therapy treatments in private homes or private offices rather than going to the lab and having it all done the same way. And I was quite surprised by the results because we got significant improvements in all the parameters that we looked at. Um, even when people were going and having their regular Reiki practice or Reiki um, therapies, um, rather than going to a center and having someone, uh, all the practitioners do exactly the same thing and no music playing and no aromatherapy, et cetera, et cetera. And it seems to be just as effective. So I thought that was quite interesting. But the, the main point with respect to guidelines is that it really makes the um, existence of these guidelines even more important that we know exactly um, what was going on, whether it be in a private um, practice or in a in a center in a regulated center we need to know exactly what was going on so that we can understand the results and understand their significance Great. let me ask you a follow-up question to that Anne, if you don't mind just to be clear for all of the healers that might be watching right now these guidelines aren't necessarily saying that you have to all trials need to do it this way what you're saying is you need to tell us what you did exactly right? Yes, that's a very good point. Mm -hmm. yep. yep, very good. So um, one of the, in, when you write up a, a trial, there's a formal way of doing it. And I'm sure uh, almost everybody uh, listening in today has read a, a journal article that reports a clinical trial. So when you get to the, the discussion section after you describe uh, the background and your methods and what the results were. The final is a discussion section. And most journals will require you now to um, write a couple of paragraphs on what you feel were the limitations of your study. So we, we address that in terms of what Anne was saying by encouraging people to add a section on how they, what they felt was the extent to which their clinical trial protocol did reflect real world practice. And again, it, it, it is a kind of dance as to how specific you need to be for a research study and how adaptive you need to be when you're in clinical practice to go treat individually as opposed to by a standard um, protocol. So what we did, and again, Shaman is, is correct with saying we're not specifying um, what and how you have to report, but we're encouraging you to say how, to what extent did you feel part of your protocol for, for whatever reason might not have reflected clinical practice. And that needs to be taken into account when somebody is reading um, the, your paper, whether it's a hospital administrator or it's, an, it's a fellow practitioner to learn from, from what you did. Um, the, the other area that I introduced into, the, into our discussion, which I had a lot of fun with, which are called known unknowns. I mean, it's one thing to try to encourage people to describe all of the variables that are known, but some of you may remember we had a, a Secretary of Defense in this country, Donald Rumsfeld, um, and he was he presided over uh, the issue of weapons of mass destruct weapons of mass destruction, and he did a a kind of um, a dance when reporters were trying to pin him down and he went to a whole into a whole kind of uh spiel about uh known knowns and known unknowns and unknown unknowns but i think the phrase that he used uh known unknowns is um is helpful in in this uh in this context um people often talk when I, when I talk to practitioners, 
they talk about the energy in the room and what particular effect that might have on the outcome. For example, if if there's a kind of energy, a healing energy that's developed in the room, you might not want to be treating those people who are in the control group, the sham acupuncture group, in the same room as you're treating, um, you're giving the real intervention. So, so we're encouraging people to think about what these known unknowns are. Um, another problem is that um, again, to give the example of Reiki, if, if I'm testing four or five different practitioners, we always prefer not to just test one practitioner because then we're testing that person's ability rather than testing is Reiki effective. We're saying, is that person effective? So how do we know if all four or five people, um, I hate to use the word ability, but how do we know if they're all um, in creating the same level of rapport between themselves and the patient, which could be an important variable. Um, how do we know if they've all had the same experience um, and are all as proficient in treating a particular condition that's, that's under study? So this is another known unknown. And in the paper, we're encouraging people to write in and let us know what they think are additional factors um, that fall in this category when you're doing when you're doing research. Thank you for unpacking that the the known unknowns and it, it it makes me want to ask you all this question. These are reporting guidelines for clinical trials. Now typically when we think of consort and some of these guidelines, we think of randomized controlled trials. Are your guidelines um, fluid enough to address not just efficacy studies, but effectiveness studies that often are more, you could say, real world applied studies in biofield therapies? Well, when Stricter first came out, um, Hugh McPherson had, so the C in Stricter was originally um, controlled trials, so standards for reporting um, interventions in control trials of acupuncture. When we came up to do revisions, this same question of the stricta, the same question arose that you brought up. And so I suggested, let's just change the C to clinical trials instead of control trials, because it's there's such a, a now a, a well needed emphasis on um, trials that are not using sham uh, biofield therapy or whatever that may be, where you ask someone who's not a, a Reiki practitioner to watch the practitioner and mimic exactly what they're doing. And hopefully they're doing the, the hand movements without the, the, the Reiki itself. So, um, so that's, really important to to build that in to um, the thinking about the clinical trial. So, you know, I, I guess the kind of research that that you're talking about, Shamani, is, is, has a general term. It's called comparative effectiveness research. So it's much more important. You can learn a lot more from a clinical trial um, that's important for making clinical decisions by comparing if you're if you've got a if you have a new drug to compare the new drug to the existing drug to have a new kind of surgery compared to the existing surgery um, rather than comparing the drug to a placebo so if you're comparing two different kinds of interventions then you can say even which one is not only clinically more effective, but you can ask which one is more cost effective this. You can ask, does the new treatment begin to kick in benefits sooner than the old treatment? Um, do the benefits last longer? So this whole kind of research is called comparative effectiveness. And so your point is really well taken that these guidelines were carefully crafted so that not just to refer, we, we say, 
to describe the control or the comparative group. Right. So, so it will apply to comparative effectiveness research as well as the typical randomized placebo controlled trial. And I just, I know there's a lot of discussion on this and I'd love us to move sort of into what we see, you know, and the role of these guidelines in the future of healing research. And there, as you know, in our community, there's a lot of discussion on how we should be conducting this research. Do we want to continue to just do randomized placebo controlled trials? Are we after, you know, I know this is beyond the scope of the clinical guidelines discussion we're having now, but is the point of biofield research, even in cell and animals to deduce one singular biologically plausible mechanism, which is what the NIH is telling us we need to do in order to get funding to do this work. Your guidelines, I know that you hope that what will happen from this is that it will up level the quality of research in clinical studies, whether they be effectiveness studies, whether they be small clinical trials, randomized control trials, there are a number of different kinds of ways that we can conduct research, clinical research in biofield therapies. Including these guidelines, but even beyond guidelines, since we have you both in the virtual room right now, and you're both such experts you've been conducting, and I just want to let people know, I highly recommend you get on Google Scholar or PubMed and search out Richard and Anne's publications. They have authored re research both singularly and together, looking at things together like healer Healy interaction, so they are absolutely you know, in many ways, out of the box thinkers and kind of looking into the depths of the biofields between us and how we understand healing. So each of you have conducted novel research in your own right, as well as what we would, might say sort of gold standard research from the medical models perspective. What do you see as really necessary and important at this juncture to move the field of research forward for biofield therapies? Uh, maybe I'll start with that. So I think that we do definitely need to do more of these real world studies. Um, there are very few, at least um, compared to the clinical trials, very few studies in the real world. And I think that we'd learn a lot through more research there. Um, and then also using the guidelines um, I what I'm hoping in the future is that people will read the guidelines, see what they're supposed to report, and then that will make them design the experiments more effectively as well. Maybe they see in, the, oh, we should report this. Hmm, we didn't even think of doing that. Maybe we should put that in the experiment. I mean, especially like control groups, even now, um, or, or comparative effectiveness groups. Even now, there are still a lot of um, studies where there's just the therapy and there's not, nothing to compare it with. So I think that um, that would help definitely. The reporting guidelines would help in the design of the experiments. And I think this is really important. Um, I'm going to read something here. I read this out a lot in presentations. It's from the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health. And if you go to their website and you type in Reiki, this is what it says. Bottom line, Reiki hasn't been clearly shown to be effective for any health-related purpose. Most of the research has not been of high quality and the results have been inconsistent. Okay, so the first sentence I think is inaccurate. I mean, Reiki hasn't been clearly shown to be effective for any health related purpose. I think that is totally inaccurate. But the other thing they're saying about the research not being of high quality, well, some experiments are of high quality, some studies are excellent. But there are there's a, a significant percentage that are weak, for the reasons that we've been talking about, um, the lack of detail in their um, the write-up of the experimental protocol, the description of the practitioners, um, lack of comparative or control groups, etc. And I think that in order to get um, biofield therapies really grounded in um, clinical medicine, we do need to get higher quality studies published. And I think these guidelines will help do that. Yeah, spot on, spot on, Anne. And um, for those of you um, in the listening audience who are researchers, most of you are familiar with, with ResearchGate, which alerts you to any 
publications by any person you've worked with in the past or publications in your field you, you may be interested in. And I'm always seeing um, publications that use stricter, the, the acupuncture guidelines. I'm very encouraged. But um, in the past decade or so, when especially when people are planning a very large scale trial, you're encouraged, and there are specific journals that uh, for, for this purpose, you're encouraged to publish your protocol um, so that you can be held to it. And that's one of the reasons held to it when your paper comes out. Did you really do exactly what you said you were going to do in in the in the in the trial? But I'm seeing that the guide, the stricter guidelines are referred to in these papers that publish the protocol. So what Anne said is actually beginning to happen. People are using these guidelines because how do you report something that you're supposed to report if you forgot to include it in your actual protocol? So people are beginning to use the guidelines for reporting uh, as a help in terms of designing their studies. Wonderful. Thank you. What we need for the future, I'll just say, is the vast majority of trials of biofield therapies are we call are what we call pilot studies. Mm -hmm. And that's because, in large part, there isn't the funding to then do these large-scale trials that are so needed. A pilot study gives you uh, an idea of how feasib feasible it is to recruit patients for this particular condition. It gives you, an, they'll give you an idea of whether you have a huge number of dropouts. And so it's very difficult to use a particular biofield therapy on a particular population of patients. So you, you learn all these things in a pilot study, and then you're supposed to apply them. That's what happens with a good pharmaceutical studies and most studies in, in biomedicine. We don't have the funds, but if we get better and better um, indications, higher quality, as well as positive outcomes from pilot studies, there is going to be much more of a groundswell, I think, uh, from private foundations, as well as from the NIH, to begin to fund the larger, more definitive, more robust clinical trials that are so needed in this field of biofield Thanks. therapies. Richard, thank you so much for naming that because, you know, I and probably you guys too, when you're out there teaching about this work, will often, you know, be approached by a practitioner or even a budding researcher who will say, I really want to do something. I really want to contribute to the research. I want to do research. I don't have hundreds of thousands of dollars or even a million bucks to do a clinical trial. And sometimes one can feel very defeated. But what I hear you saying, I hear you both saying two things. One, we need real world research. Right. We need to demonstrate what biofield therapies, let's, for example, what's what's the impact of a biofield therapy for reducing anxiety compared to the gold standard treatment like cognitive behavioral therapy. Right. That's an example of a, a trial that we can do. And um, certainly those in energy psychology have been doing that for some time. And I hear you saying that we start where we are and we just do really good quality work. And actually, we want to build from a smaller study and what we call feasibility studies to larger trials. There's a systematic process that we all go through for research and biofield therapy research is no exception. So the good news about that is for our fellow practitioners or graduate students, you can conduct a study with some support from a mentor and hopefully some seed grants, which we would very much like to be able to provide, you know, the Subtle Energy Funding Collective had done a biofield fellowship program for young budding researchers. Hopefully they'll be doing that again next year. So there are some healing organizations that provide seed funding for pilot research. This research is meaningful. It does help us get to the next step. So we often at Chi will through our newsletters announce when we know a colleague is um, or a, a participating organization is giving out small research grants. They are kind of small grants right now. They're not enough to conduct robust clinical trials, but we're getting there. And even at this Consciousness and Healing Initiative, some of you know that we're conducting this randomized controlled trial now on sound healing for anxiety. That was born out of first doing a smaller study, a feasibility study, where we didn't have a lot of money, 
And it was COVID, you know, we had a lot of limitations, but we designed a carefully controlled study and published two papers demonstrating, yes, we can collect data. Yes, people will do the intervention. This is what they reported. We use gold standard metrics for research and we found that there was a massive drop off in anxiety over a few short weeks so that set us up to then apply for more funding from private donors to do a larger controlled trial and so we're in the same boat as everyone else I just want everyone to know that we're all in this journey together and we begin where we are um, and I want to move to questions I want to honor that there are a number of questions. And the first question is a question I'm sure many people have on their mind, which is where do we get a copy of these reporting guidelines? Okay, <laughs> thanks for that. So um, unlike most um, studies that are published, um, you can only publish a study in one journal and any journal will ask to make sure that, that you're you you choose which journal you'd like to have the study published in, but once you make that choice, that's it. With reporting guidelines, you want as wide um, an audience as possible. So there's precedent both with consort and stricta and some of the other guidelines that you can, under these limited examples, you can get the guidelines published in multiple journals. So in working with those editors that were um, that helped us finalize the guidelines, these guidelines are going to be published uh, as of February 1st. Four different journals are going to publish these first online, and then there'll be a different uh, timeline for when they're published uh, hard copies in the journals. But all four complementary therapies in medicine, explore, Global Advances in Integrative Medicine and Health and the Journal of Integrative and Complementary Medicine have all agreed to upload um, these guidelines uh, on their websites on February 1st. Okay, so that's the first thing. Um, the second thing I wanted to say was, um, and I noticed this was in the chat, someone asked about what about case studies? Um, and they are really important. These guidelines do not necessarily um, cover case studies, but there's a wonderful um, online uh, site where you can go. It's called CARE, C-A-R-E, and it stands for case reports, the C-A and the R-E. So the CARE. So just Google CARE guidelines, and, and those are wonderful guidelines for biomedical and non-biomedical case reports and it's it's really important to to find journals that will accept case reports in um, alternative medicine in and um, specifically for our discussion in um, biofield therapies Wonderful. And thank you. Jason's just put the link to that care statement in the chat. So for those of you who are conducting case studies or interested in case studies, please click the link that Jason just sent in the chat, which takes you to the care guidelines, different yeah. from what we're talking about. So just to recap, you will have access to these reporting guidelines. Part of the goal here, and this relates to George's question and statement that in order for this to work, we have to spread this out widely across the community worldwide. Everyone needs to know about these guidelines and use these guidelines. So we will be sharing with you all. We're going to make this webinar free for everyone because people may find it also very useful later to look at those guidelines and understand Anne and Richard, you're, you know, just having you unpack this a little bit. So we will send you a replay to this webinar um, and make sure that it's available freely for everyone. And we will create links to the reporting guidelines as soon as they're able. Please check your email. We do have a new email system for those of you who had trouble getting a webinar link. That was why um, we're going to make sure that, you know, we have to build trust within a new email system. It's just the way the whole thing works. But we will make sure that you get access to these papers. And then our ask for you is that you share this with your community, with your community of practitioners and researchers so that they are aware of these reporting guidelines that again are being published in four journals, respected peer-reviewed published journals 
worldwide. It's part of the process that Richard and Anne and their team have really moved forward to make sure that all of these I's are dotted and T's are crossed, so to speak. Um, so thank you for that. We have a sure. couple. And of I'll just up. say, um, Shamini, just really quickly, if all else fails and you can't get a copy online, just send me an email, um, richard at chi.is. That's our website. Um, um, yeah, Jason, our, maybe you can put that in chat. Richard, Richard at chi.is. And I'll make sure after February 1 that you'll get a copy. Yeah, great. Um, so Richard has offered his email for you to be in touch with him. Um, and we will list the four journals again, Richard, are Explore, Complementary Therapies in Medicine, mm -hmm. Global Advances, it used to be called Global Advances in Health and Medicine, now it's called Global Advances in Integrative Medicine and Health, and the journal, what used to be called the Journal of Alternative and Complementary Medicine, now is called the Journal of Integrative and Complementary Medicine. So those are the four. Great, great. Our time is coming to a close. I want to thank everyone who has come to this to really help us all rise together to facilitate better and more impactful research in biofield therapies so that we can reduce the suffering worldwide from clinical ailments that um, we know we can address with our biofield therapy practice. It's um, tremendous. It's incredibly important. Again, I want to thank each of you who come to the table as chief contributors. Your contributions help make these kinds of webinars and the spreading of research information possible. I want to thank our donor for this project, George and Holly Stone, who, because of their support, were able to help facilitate, which was a relatively low investment project compared to, say, a randomized control trial with high impact. And it's because of private donors like the Stones and others that were able to conduct a number of, of great work and studies in this area. We do hope to get the National Institutes of Health on to the table to help fund this work. They certainly should be. This is part of that process of, you know, really helping people understand the value and the tremendous impact of the healing work that so many of us do. So with that, Richard and Anne, I just want to thank you again for sharing your time. Any parting words that you have um, for our community here? I really feel optimistic that we have these guidelines because I think just their existence will make um, this kind of work, the biofield therapy work, be taken more seriously by other scientists. Just having those guidelines means that we're thinking about it. Thanks, Anne. And we'll get the guidelines posted on a, there's a, a, a website that posts all the different guidelines and just getting included on that website, the website the URL is called Equator. It's it's also an acronym, but Equator, as in what's girdling the Earth, is is the um, is their acronym. Um, so I couldn't agree more, Anne, and just wanted to thank you and and a, a shout out to Meredith if you're watching. Uh, Meredith has moved to the Netherlands, but she still um, works with us. And um, thank you, Shamani, for a wonderful job of hosting and guiding us through all the issues involved in getting people to know about the guidelines. Yeah, well, thank you. And thank everyone for joining and for sharing hearts and minds today. It's our pleasure to host these dialogues and this impactful work. Thank you, everybody. And have a great day, evening, as it may be, or a great sleep for those of you who are joining us internationally live today. Many blessings and we'll see you all soon.